Joyce, welcome to the show. Thank you. So I've really been looking forward to this conversation and I've read your book last month and it was so eye-opening and I'm really excited to get into it all. So before we start, could you give the audience a little background about who you are and what it is you do? Okay. Um, well, I am a lecturer in the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology at this moment. And prior to that, I have been a professor in the Department of Psychology um, in a number of universities in England, in Canada, in, in the U.S. Um, I started out watching children um, in their free time when there were no adults around doing whatever they wanted. And I think that was kind of the most uh, helpful thing that I've ever done. And I've kind of gravitated over the course of my career to um, reading literature about non-humans, um, mostly primates, um, but also mammals more generally. And now I teach courses on non-humans, non mammals and, and non-human primates. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, okay. Wonderful, wonderful. So your book, Warriors and Warriors, talks about the evolutionary strategies of men and women. And for whoever didn't catch my pronunciation there, that's warriors as in those who fight and warriors as in those who worry. And I would love for you to just give us a little bit of background, first of all, in terms of the evolutionary process and the mechanics you know, of natural selection. Why is it that men and women specialized in different ways, and we develop these different evolutionary strategies. Okay, so I guess evolutionary biology is based on the premise that you need to pass on your genes, and that's it, right? You don't have to be good or bad or make a lot of money or not, whatever. You just have to pass on your genes. And in mammals, um, the two sexes have developed different ways to do that. So females generally do most of the childcare and all of the females are the ones who have gestation and lactation. And because of that, oftentimes spend the most of their lives and in humans all of their lives taking care of their children and maybe their grandchildren too. So that's a huge, huge, huge amount of work and responsibility. And to me, there's no way around that. Um, it's kind of 24 seven in the beginning. If you have several children, it's for years and years and years. And usually you end up with the grandchildren too. So that's your whole life. Um, for males, there isn't, I um, find that incredible attraction to children, but there is an incredible attraction to having sex. So most men, at least for a good part of their life, would really like to have sex. And that's classic what you find with non-human males, because if they don't have sex, that's the end of their genes. That's it. So there has to be something that compels them to pass on their genes. The problem is lots of women are, um, and this is true for non-human females as well, gestating and lactating and don't want to become pregnant again. Um, so the men have a problem. How are they going to ever get get a mate? How are they going to be able to reproduce? And it's very serious. Um, and this is kind of built into the mind. And so there's a lot of competition that's necessary to be a male and to triumph and beat the other males and attract the females. And, you know, they do these experiments with fruit flies and they do them with um, non-human mammals and primates and, and humans. And it's, it's really consistent. That is not to say in any way that females are less strong, are more vulnerable, it's just the opposite than males. But it's really different strategies to pass on the genes. And that's all that counts is passing on the genes. And that doesn't mean that men don't help their children or their offspring. If it's non-humans, they do sometimes. But they um, are freer than females are to pursue mating, to pursue other things, and to compete. And they really enjoy that, and they have a good time doing that. Um, so it is different goals in terms of childcare versus mating that are forefronted, and different strategies, because one has to be very careful if one is going to take care of offspring to not hurt oneself. And that's a big part of some of the research I've done. If you're a female, and if you're a male, if you don't pass on your genes, you're doomed. That's it for you. So 
you do have to be a little more forward, a little more competitive, a little bit more direct um, in order to be able to find a female. And, and I am now talking quite across species. I'm happy to talk about just humans, but it's pretty ubiquitous across species that you have these sex differences. There are you know, some species that are slightly different and there's huge differences in local conditions where there might be no men around and the women have to do a lot more. And, or um, in some cases, the, the men are really necessary in order for the children to survive. But generally, overall, there, there are these huge differences in approaches to life. Amazing, amazing. So I think, you know, we laid the groundwork here and I think it's important for people to understand why these sex differences emerge. And we'll get into all of the different uh, things that you just mentioned, right? We'll, we'll zoom in a little bit more. But before we do that, I do want to, to just say, you know, if people are thinking, you know, why, why is understanding the evolutionary process important here? And I think, first of all, it helps us understand why we are who we are. And if anyone, you know, takes away anything from this conversation, I really hope that they understand that, first of all, sex differences are real. We are different. Men and women are different. And that isn't to say, and you mentioned this as well, that isn't to say that women are inferior to men, but we each specialized in different ways. We specialized with different goals. Men had to compete. And as we'll, as we'll discuss, you know, men have a much harder time finding a mate and females, it's usually, usually an easy thing. We will want to compete for a higher status mate, but there are different goals. There are trade-offs. And that isn't to say that females are inferior to men. We just have different priorities. And these natural inclinations, I think are really important to understand. And, you know, I'm a Jungian at heart. And, you know, making the unconscious conscious is the name of the game. Jung has his quote, until we make the unconscious conscious, it'll direct our life and we'll call it fate. So understanding these really deep rooted natural instincts and how they're guiding us and how they make us different, I think can help us, first of all, relate to one another, you know, men and women and understanding the differences. And just on a personal level, really aligning ourselves with what's important because I think there are quite uh, mixed messages, you know, to say the least today. Women are told that they should, uh, you know, go for a career and that children are secondary and men are, uh, you know, being demonized for their masculinity. So I want people to understand that masculinity isn't inherently toxic. There are antisocial uh, male behaviors, of course, but there are so many masculine virtues. And, you know, I've heard you discuss this as well, the ambition and the drive and that competitiveness. There's a lot of beauty in that. So if anyone, any man listening out there is feeling demoralized, you know, and feeling demonized for for that ambition, I hope that we'll be able to correct it in this conversation. And the third thing, and which we'll hopefully get be able to get into today, is the fact that you know females do compete. We compete in uh, very subtle ways, but we do compete. And I think one of the things that was most uh, illuminating for me from uh, your research was the fact that you know I've heard this narrative uh, obviously over and over again that the patriarchy is keeping us down and that men are oppressing women and that we need to be small uh, to not you know uh, uh, hurt uh, a man's ego but really you know what you've found is that we're, we're unable to compete because other females you know don't really accept a woman who's openly competing so just talking about, you know, these kinds of uh, themes today, uh, I hope will shed light um, on a lot of this. So to get started, we'll start with men. Can you tell us about boys' fascination with the enemy and where you think this comes from? 
Okay, so um, I guess in my earliest studies and, and continuing, I find that boys are really attracted to one another. They really enjoy one another's company. So starting from age three, there's a lot of rough and tumble play. There's um, After a year or two, there's a lot of group interactions. There's a lot of intergroup interactions. And I think what that leads to is, and I, I will be quite blatant about it, warfare. And in our closest living genetic relatives, chimpanzees, there is actual warfare. The males get together, they bond, they've shown increased oxytocin levels before they even begin. Then they head out single file silently and they go to the periphery of their territory where they will find the enemy, hostile neighboring male community. And they will attack and they will kill them. And it's, um, you know, at morally it's horrifying, but from a genetic point of view, it's very beneficial because the more you can encroach and take over another community's territory, the more food and space for your, the females in your community and for your offspring to, to develop. So that's what happens. And to me, to think that warfare has no biological basis when our closest living genetic relatives engage in it doesn't make sense. So there is, from a, a genetic propagation of the genes perspective, reason to engage in warfare. And being aware of that, to me, is really, really important. But what does it require? It requires incredible cooperation between males. Males are willing to risk their lives for one another. This is something females don't do. So if we just go back then to humans, whether there's a fire or a burglary or it's climate change or there's a riot or or there's war, females are not rushing out to sacrifice their own lives. Doesn't make sense because they have children at home whose lives depend on them being there for them or, or the children would die. So the males do that and, and it really does protect the community. And in hunter-gatherer societies that are still living today, the males feed the community, they protect the community, they're essential to the community. So what was amazing to me when I started out was seeing these behaviors in three, four, and particularly five-year-olds, and then from then on, um, males, where they were really so group-oriented and so happy to run into each other and run over one another and have a huge fight and then make up. And the sense I got was they needed to keep those males in that group, wherever it was, together. And, and cohesive because you never know what might happen. And then what would they talk about? They would talk about John Gottman has wonderful work, you know, the enemy, it could be a shark, it could be an alien, it could come from anywhere, right? The sky, the water, wherever it is. And those males are on the front line and that's their favorite thing to do. And that's what I could see. They really enjoyed it. Their stories were about made up creatures that attacked, but they got together or the Superman was the top of it, but they, he had backup and he will, they were able to protect the community. So it's, it's very benevolent in one way and, you know, very terrifying in another way. But, you know, that makes sense to me when you see it again and again and again in community after community and you see the rough and tumble play and you see the weapons and you see the love of hunting across hunter-gatherer societies who've had no contact with Western nations. But to me, it's very hard to get away from the idea that this has some innate basis and that it is useful for passing on one's genes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that, you know, in our modern society today, especially, you know, in, in countries like America that are fairly safe in terms of, you know, other countries coming to attack, it's really easy to forget how uh, important these traits are, you know, being able to organize and being able to, to be fearless and to, to engage in warfare. I think that, you know, in, in, in my country, in Israel, we, we have a few, a few countries around us that don't want us to be here. And it's harder to forget the fact that, you know, we, we need men and you know, we have obviously all women uh, are drafted as well. But at the end of the day, you know, combat is a male sport. And it's 
in our modern morality, we would might want to, you know, all live in peace. And why mm. do we even have this? But, you know, throughout history, w- we needed men to protect us. So not to not to demonize, you know, these qualities, I think is really important, especially, you know, in, in uh, young children today, uh, they're being um, kind of, uh, you know, discouraged for from like play fighting and things like that and you know um, mothers can uh, get really uh, really afraid of that kind of behavior and, and I think you know it's it's healthy to a certain degree uh, so I think I think it's important to keep in mind now I want to talk about the topic of competition male competition why is it that men compete and why has it been so important for them in terms of survival and reproduction Okay, so uh, first of all, I think boys and men really, really enjoy competition. So whether you look at, you know, silly games or you look at sports through, you know, through the millennia, there are lots and lots of examples all over the world of males loving that. I mean, really, really enjoying it. And of course, it makes sense. Competition at root is a way to rise to the top of the hierarchy and to flaunt your high status. And what's amazing to me is the subordinate males, whether they're children or they're adults, they accept a male who has worked his way to the top and beat the other ones. It's not resented. It's like, wow, well, he did it. I respect that guy. You play a competition, you play your heart out, and the other guy wins. It's accepted, and you're allowed to flaunt it. But there is really this bonding. It's not just, it's not just the way a lot of people think of competition, which is negative. It's not at all. It's to, to be able to be successful as a competitor, you have to have players. You have to have other ones who are willing to accept the outcome or it's no fun at all. And I think men are really good at that. And it, 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 as a female, I find it hard to understand, but I see it all the time. And I've done a lot of studies on it. And whether I'm looking at little kids or I'm looking at adults and across the you know cultures, you see, and of course across species, males compete all the time, but even in non-humans, they can let it go and accept the outcomes at the end and play by the hierarchical rules. And of course, the reason for it is the top male will get to meet. And so he gets to pass on his genes. What's so interesting, and I think people don't accept as much is oftentimes the top male doesn't stay top for that long. And so there is a fluidity about it and he gets beaten eventually and another male becomes the top and he gets to pass on his genes. So there are, you know, all kinds of reasons for it. But underneath it all to me is this real love of competition and ability to cooperate with one's competitors. And that is something that I think females don't do so well. Right, right. Well, we'll get into why females don't do that so well, but I think I just want to highlight the fact that, um, and you and you mentioned this uh, in your book, the fact that men know how to organize into groups, and at the end of the day, partnering up with other men who are better at a certain skill, right, that are specialized at a certain skill, can really benefit in warfare, right? I, and it increases the man's status to be associated with another man who's really good at something. So, yes. so they have, they have this innate ability to really cooperate and to, to accept someone being better than them, which is amazing. And I think, <laughs> I think also just this competitive drive, I, I'm, you know, I'm seeing a lot of that being uh, really, really, uh, uh, you know, discouraged and as if, as if, um, their ambition is trying to get ahead, um, you know, and and to not let others, uh, you know, get ahead. And I think any society that tries to suppress that drive is really, you know, shooting itself in the foot, so to speak, because that drive and that energy can be channeled into production and innovation and things that would really benefit society. Yes, I, to- I totally agree. I really totally agree. I mean, little boys, they may be running amok in the classroom and disrupting the teacher, but they find something they love and they can take off. They can totally get into it. And it's just so self-motivated and it's wonderful. And as you said, they can get other boys involved 
And even, you know, when you see a, a three-year-old and he's yelling because he has the best paper airplane <laughs> and the other boys are like, yeah, but you can't jump as high as me. And okay, he says, you're right, you can jump higher. But this one is really good at tug of war, even in the three-year-old class. And you see it and they admire each other's skills. And that's so critical for developing one's own and being part of a group where others are skilled. Right, right. And I have a story about that kind of um, competitive drive. I have a, a little cousin who's seven years old and he was uh, in my parents' backyard. And he, if, you know, if you leave him alone for too long, he'll start vandalizing. <laughs> and he, he started to pick up leaves and there was, um, you know, a lot of leaves that needed to, to get cleared out. So I just told him, I can get more leaves than you can. And he was into it. He was so into it. We cleared all the leaves. You know, we got piles and piles. And he was so excited to use this rake and that. Anyways, so that was uh, that was a clue I got from you. <laughs> it was very helpful. Excellent. Yeah. Um, now, this idea of, you know, men not being as social as women is very widely held in the social sciences. And, you know, I think obviously that this is, this comes from a place where we look at one-on-one -on -one dyadic relationships in these kinds of studies and, and women are more predisposed to those kinds of relationships. But as you mentioned, you know, men have a really, uh, really easy time organizing into a group and cooperating with each other. So can you tell us more about how these, you know, more masculine patterns of socializing look like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've always been so impressed by how sociable males are. And I have to say, um, Warfare to me is the best example of sociability. And I know people sometimes laugh when I say that, but can you imagine living on top of one another, not taking showers for days on end, sacrificing one another's lives potentially for, for each other, um, living for sometimes months and months and months like that? What could be, what honestly could be more sociable than that? And, you know, I see it in little boys. It's so natural. And the fact that you might step on somebody else's head and really hurt them, but the next day they'll forgive you because they're so into whatever they're doing, that that's really sociable. You have a lot of elasticity, as I like to call it, to do all kinds of things. So you're free and it's very, very sociable. And I do think males make close friends, but the group allows a lot of things that, um, wouldn't be allowed if, if it were just the two of you, because suppose you do have a big fight. Well, who cares? Because there's other people you can interact with. You're not all by yourself. And there right. may be a mediator. There may be a mediator in the group who says, break it up, you two, stop it, you know? And there's this loyalty to the group. So you're not gonna just end the relationship because he did this horrible thing to you. It's like, nah, it's the group that counts. So I'll ignore him for a couple of days or weeks or whatever. So there's something wonderful about being a member of a group whose activities you like. There's just something so rewarding about that, so freeing. The one-on-one -on -one relationship, of course, has all kinds of wonderful attributes in terms of being able to pour your heart out and discuss vulnerabilities and all that. But it's tenuous because if somebody does something you don't like, that's it. It's over. <laughs> and it's very hard to to deal with that. There aren't mediators. There is no loyalty to a larger group. There's no forces bringing you together. So I do think there's strengths and limits to everything. And that's always my approach. But that males are really sociable. If you look at a preschool class, which is what I like to do, or even middle childhood, um, if you look in hunter gatherers at little kids with, who are not in school, the males are just so free, right? They're not oh, sorry, thank you, is this okay? You know, right. females are very careful. And that's lovely and polite, and a lot of people in Western society like to say that sociability, right? It's like Emily Post, right? I'm very careful, so I'm very sociable. Yes, it's lovely, and we don't want conflicts, you know, to be too severe and all that. But to have the freedom to just say something wrong or by accident hit somebody or whatever, or maybe on purpose hit somebody, and have them forgive you because, hey, we're just really enjoying one another's company and that one thing you did not going to ruin everything it's just a whole different way of being and to not appreciate how well males can get along 
is to me really sad. It doesn't make any sense. I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, the fact, I just want to strengthen your point about warfare. My husband was in the special forces for over a decade and hit him and his, and his unit, they are so close. They can, you know, not speak for, for months and then pick up where they left off. And the loyalty and the trust there is really unlike any female friendship that I've seen. Um, so, so I think it's, it's such an asset. And I, anyone who, you know, who made fun of the uh, warfare example, um, I, I think, I think uh, is missing the point. Uh, and I, I did want to highlight this other, other point that you made, which was really, really eye-opening in the book, where there is this natural developmental stage where boys want to disconnect from girls. They want to disconnect from their mother right? And th th there's this rule of no girls allowed. So can you tell us what that means and where it comes from? So, um, you know, I, I see this in many, many animals. Uh, sex segregation is very uh, uh, ubiquitous. And that is females are interested in infants. They're interested in staying closer to their mothers as, as when they're infants and juveniles themselves. And even throughout life, if they can, if they're close by. Um, males, are interested in doing different things. So it's not a lot of fun to sit around and discuss some kind of vulnerability for a male. That's just really boring. And a lot of what I see as the impetus to what males are doing is they want to have fun. And, and it's not fun hanging around with the girls or, or your mother. It's not like any psychodynamic thing. It's just not fun. Girls are boring. And if a girl wants to play like the boys, okay, she's okay. But, you know, she has to enjoy it. She has to have fun. She has to be good at it. She has to do it the way the boys do. And to me, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just, we all prefer to be with people who are like us. So what happens, I think, a lot in business is you get these very, what they call homophilic um, male groups. They like each other. They like being around with each other. Maybe they have a ping pong table at work. Maybe they want to drink some beers together, whatever. And so the, the females are then, you know, left out and they feel discriminated against. And to some extent, that's absolutely true. And what you do about that, that's that's a different conversation. But it certainly makes sense that girls and women want to do what they want to do. And if a boy wants to act like them, well, fine. If he wants to play in the doll corner with them, that's fine. He can be the baby brother, right? And most boys don't want to be the baby brother, right? They mm -hmm. think that's awful. So, so what we're talking about is something really, really basic that I feel more comfortable talking about non-humans and children, human children, because it's pretty simple to see this system and see it work. And there's nothing complicated about it. You do what you like doing. And that leads to sex segregation. And of course, sex segregation makes sense when you get older because men and women have different ways of passing on their genes. But that's not the, to me, the mechanism that leads to it. It's just enjoyment. Right, right. There is also this point that you make where, you know, um, uh, military material only, right? The fact that, you know, throughout adolescence, boys toughen up. Uh, in certain societies, they go through uh, rituals, initiations, and uh, hazing uh, type ceremonies where they need to be disconnected from uh, the mother and the children, and they need to, to, you know, become warriors. And that, that does require, um, a suppression of their femininity. And that doesn't need to last forever, but that's definitely a dev developmental stage. Is that, do I have that right? Yes. I mean, I think it's more or less depending on the male. I think some males that's just what they love. They love toughness. They, you know, they love it when they're little, right? They, so it's not suppressing anything. It's expressing um, just the way they are. For other males, it's like, yeah, I can't be too vulnerable right now, which is a key part of being a female, because the enemy will see that I'm vulnerable and that's it. The whole group is in trouble. So I, you know, it depends to some extent on what you're like as a male and we all differ. It's not like within any sex, everybody's exactly the same, of course. but no, yeah, but nonetheless, that is true. On the other hand, I would also say that part of the developmental profile of females 
is being very vulnerable, being very self-protective. Because the fact is, if you aren't alive for many, many, most part of humanity, if the mother wasn't alive, that's it, the kids die. First of all, for any mammal, mammalian species, if the, you know, if the mother can't lactate, then the baby dies. But even after that, and this is particularly true in primates, the mother's enormous support for sometimes decades if the offspring stay. And that's certainly true with humans. So females have to be very self-protective. So while you're saying, yes, maybe males have to suppress their vulnerability, particularly if they're on the battlefield and they're going to die for one another to protect the community, females have to express and and really make sure they're being very self-protective because otherwise that's it if you lose your life that's the most important thing for your genes to continue on and you can't you can't afford to take any chances with that so whether it's a fire or a burglar or you know some noxious substance you better get away from it fast and to me that is not being a sissy but rather Mm -hmm. being tough and taking care of your genes so that you are there to survive for as long as possible. And they've shown if you have a grandmother around to invest in her grandchildren, those grandchildren are more likely to live. Absolutely. I think that really explains, you know, why uh, women worry more than men, you know, why we we are uh, less risk-taking on average, right? Because uh, you know, a female is required <laughs> to be around, as you said, for breastfeeding and for those early years. And just in terms of the data, you know, children who grow up without their mothers, that's really, really traumatic. Of course, losing a father is devastating as well. But a lot, a lot of people who lose their mothers don't recover in the same way. Right. So, yeah, and it's also I would say that the the grandparenting. Um, so it's we're talking about decades. It's not even just a mother, but a grandmother, and she usually invests in her daughters. So you know we're talking about the rest. Uh, I always say, a woman having a child is like committing suicide. You can't undo it, right? I mean, most women will spend the rest of their lives taking care of that child or children and the grandchildren and relatives and anybody who's vulnerable. So a woman really, really invests in her family and being alive and able to do that is critical. So you have to figure out how not to die if you if you can. And males are just thinking very, very differently. They're not thinking how not to die. Of course, it's advantageous not to die because you can't do anything if you're dead. But there are other things that are more important than dying. And that's a whole different way of thinking. Absolutely. I think that really explains how, you know, why women are better at interoception, right? We're more aware of our body and what we're feeling. We, we kind of take inventory of how we're doing every day. And men are less aware of these things, you know, they brush it off. Uh, but, but we, you know, we have that intuitive sense that we need to take care of them ourselves. So understanding, you know, this, this, you know, more vulnerable state, I think is so important because I think a lot of times we, we, you know, we, we think, uh, you know, the narrative today at least says, you know, we're, we're being oppressed, you know, men have kept us out of the workplace because they don't want us around. Uh, they don't want us to get ahead. A but I think that understanding, you know, that vulnerability and that dependence, that the fact that in those years, we need help from others is a, a, the reason really that I think masculinity is associated with independence and, you know, uh, femininity is, is associated with, you know, being in a network of relationships that are, you know, loving and caring and that can support us. And that, that doesn't mean that, you know, we can't be independent, but I think it's really important to understand how, uh, how these kind of archetypes have evolved, right? Of what is uh, masculinity and what is femininity. On I, I, would just, I would just interrupt you there and just say that, you know, men are involved in these networks. So I think the distinction that you're making is non-relative 
networks, which males are right. very much a part of. And I think right. it's critical to males, you know, their work or, or their military service or their community, whatever activities or sports. But females are a part of their families, I think, more. It's absolutely more essential for getting help with childcare. So to me, relationships are equally important to, to men and women. And I, I don't absolutely. think men need to be independent. I don't think that makes sense. And I don't like the idea that women are dependent or communal, whatever, in a way that men aren't. Because men are very communal and very dependent on each other, oftentimes more than women are, because it's their lives that they're depending on their brothers, right, who are fictive kin, but their brothers to save, right, or protect, or if they do get, you know, hurt to maybe keep them alive. So I don't agree with the idea that men are more independent and gentic. That doesn't make sense to me. And it, and I don't agree with the idea that women are more dependent and communal. I think it's the sphere that counts. And for, for women, it's the family. It's a hierarchy, a very generational hierarchy that you can't do anything about. You can't make yourself older than your mother or your grandmother, right? That's it. Or, you know, younger than your children. So you are embedded in that and you can't replace kin. So in that sense, it, it's less fluid men can change. But I do think for a man to be healthy, he has to be embedded in relationships. And part of those relationships are with other men. And that's critical. It, it really is critical to me, to a man's health to be have those relationships. He just thrives. So I get frustrated because I do think a little bit the social sciences are so involved in this idea that, you know, women are communal and dependent. And I, I don't think that at all. I mean, I, I just don't, I see women as being very independent. They're required to take care of individual survival, keep them alive. And they're the number one on the front lines to me of taking care of children and keeping them alive. And that is hugely independent. You know, when there's emergencies, which there always are with children, you know, always, it's not like you can depend on anyone else. You've got to figure it out and you've got to do it quick and you've got to deal with it. It's like, to me, the front lines of a war because children are very vulnerable. 50% of our children die, right? So that's huge number of people. I think forget that because with in modern or not modern, in Western societies, the, the healthcare is so good. But 50% death rate, no wonder we're worrying all the time. And that's huge. You have to just jump over everyone who says, Oh, don't worry about that. No, you need to worry because your child could die and quick. It's very fast. And it's 24 hours a day you're responsible for this. So to me, that's very, very independent. And you've got to figure it out. And it's always different. And men, oh, they can relax. You know, they're not <laughs> on the, if they're in a war situation, okay. If they're, you know, playing some kind of contest or if they're at work and, you know, there's high stakes, fine. But it goes away. Then it's like they've got time off. They're, it's just not the same thing. So, uh, you know, I, I just like to dispel some of those ideas that I think are prominent in the social sciences of, of women being communal and, and men not being, you know, being agentic, as if women don't get anything done. That just drives me nuts. <laughs> no, I could, I could not agree with you more. I could not agree with you more. I think, you know, I'm thinking of uh, the hero's journey kind of idea of, you know, man, a man can venture out and explore and, you know, he can be part of a group of unrelated men and he can switch and, you know, become part of another organization. But I think a woman, as you said, we're, we're in this hierarchy of kin, right? The grandmothers and the mother and the children, and, and that doesn't go away. You know, we're, we're very tightly knit. So, I think just that distinction was in my mind, but I could not agree more. You know, uh, mothers have to do so much and they are very independent in how they care for their children. And a lot of times, you know, most, most of the childcare is on their shoulders. So I absolutely agree that it's not that we're dependent and needy and, uh, you know, can't get anything done. Uh, I, it's just this, uh, you know, this portrayal of, of, you know, the, the hierarchy, uh, the, the familial hierarchy. So about that, about female relationships, could you tell us more about how women friendships look like, you know, relative to how male friendships look like? 
Okay, so uh, we we discussed before the idea that they're much more likely to be dyadic or maybe triadic. Um, they're very intense. It is a requirement for a female friendship, as far as I know, to disclose vulnerabilities about oneself. Now, why exactly this happens, I'm not sure. Yes, it can be supportive. And if you're having a hard time, it, it's wonderful to be able to you know, tell another person. But it also is exposing a lot of vulnerability, which means somebody can use it against you. So it's a requirement, which always makes me nervous. Why must you open up like that? And it makes me think that there's this sense of, okay, I, I'm really expressing that I'm not going to compete with you because I have all these problems. And that is, you know, has some problems with it because suppose something comes up and there is the competition. What do you do then? And what happens if what, what women's friendships are based on is equal? What happens if one goes ahead of the other? What, what do you do then? And there's no easy solution to that. And, and I find that it's so important. There are all these rules for women's friendship. The, the vulnerability, the equality, and the no conflict allowed. Now, how can you have an honest relationship with this when there's no conflict? When I say this to some of my students, I say, does any, any of you who are women, you go home, uh, is there no conflict in your family? Is everybody polite and nice? Does anybody ever scream? And of course, everybody bursts out laughing because everybody knows when you're at home and you're a woman, you scream and you yell and you have fights and, and that's normal. It's not like we don't do that. So what in earth is happening when you get these, thank you, please, oh, would you like to do this? And oh, <laughs> you're so sweet and pretty and lovely. Well, that's not how you are at home. So you have two very different uh, ways of being as females. And you can see this even in the preschool, because if another girl starts being bossy or shouting, all the girls are like, what? She is awful. And, and they'll socially exclude her. And so what you get is you learn very early on from the other girls that you better be an equal and you better not engage in those behaviors or you're not going to have any friends. So you have this um, difficult balance, I would say, that, that women and girls in their same-sex friendships must figure out. And, and it's complicated. It's really complicated. And it's not to say that women and girls don't love their friends. They do. And it means the world to be able to have uh, someone who's not related to, who's not involved in your family dynamics um, out there supporting you. And that's great. But it requires a lot of care. And there's, I think, a lot of tension. And that's what I certainly observe when I can see girls who are friends from a distance. You know, they're, they're not naturally jumping at each other or yelling and screaming. It, you know, it's, it's more careful and it's more parallel. So it's not like we're fighting who gets the doll first and I'm going to beat you over the head so I grab it. It's, you know we're going to take turns and we're going to be careful, you know, and so it's, it's very, very different. And of course, competition is very, very subtle because you can't let someone know you're competing as opposed to the males who just really will hit each other over the head sometimes if they need something or certainly shout about it. And you watch, I mean, I've done some studies on sports and, you know, the males are really, really going at each other. And of course, the females do that to some extent, but at the end, the males are fine. They hug each other. They feel fine about it. And the females are like, wow, you know, this is not, this was not good that I lost. And so you get a, a very different dynamic, whether you're talking about close friends or even just two females versus two males. That's amazing. I think that, you know, understanding that, first of all, females, as you said, we we are, we have evolved to be around kin, right? And a lot of times female friendships kind of feel like family. They can be very close and very satisfying, but there's a very low threshold for, for a breakup. You know, if, uh, if uh, a friend said something that maybe I felt like she's trying to show me that she's better than me, right? Or, if there was actual conflict or if she actually tried to hurt me, it's game over and it's very hard to reconcile. Why do you think 
uh, women are so careful around other women? Why do we feel this need to be so nice? Okay, so that, that's a complicated question. I think it all comes back to the fact that um, women have to take care of their offspring. And that's a huge, huge responsibility. So female friends are kind of an add-on. And it's a wonderful thing. It feels so good to have a female friend out there. But in the end, you know, particularly if you have to work, which throughout history, most women have had to do, and you have families to take care of. So you're talking about, you know, reproduction and production. When is there time for friends? And yes, it feels great to have that time, but it is really kind of an extracurricular activity is the way I, I will put it. And it's therefore not that important. So as much as it's pleasurable and as much as we like to get along with others, and certainly we don't have, want to be con in conflict and we don't want to be socially excluded because that's really scary to have that happen. And women worry about that all the time. And so do girls, right? Um, so what you have then is this extracurricular activity that's great fun and feels so nice and I'm sure is very helpful in many ways, but in the end is not that important. In contrast for me, the males, their relationships are critically important. So what you're talking about is saving the community. If we're uh, just talking about hunter-gatherer communities now, they go out and they do the hunting. And, you know, new research is saying, well, women hunt too. Yeah, women do some hunting, but not to the extent that men do. And those that protein is really important. Men also protect the community. And who's going to be the people you would want to depend on most for protection or for hunting or for any kind of communal activity? It's going to be fairly similarly aged men who probably many of whom are not going to be your relatives. And that means you need to be able to quickly bind together with these men, whoever they are, who are close by in the event of some kind of emergency and work together as a group and not worry about who said what or you might even hate the guy. Doesn't matter because you need to work together for the preservation of your genes, which are with your children and your families, whatever, and maybe far away or maybe close. And but it's a whole different thing. So so. That's how I see it, that men are really um, primed to invest a lot in other unrelated males. And that is not an extracurricular activity. It's critical to their well-being. And to me, you know, when people talk about toxic masculinity, to me, the problem with men is not having groups that, you know, not having activities that they're doing together. Um, now, some of it, obviously, you can get together and do bad things, right? Anybody can do bad things. But in a group, you have a lot more power to do bad things. Nonetheless, to me, that is the most important thing that men can do is work together in communities to, you know, they're very effective, whether it's business, government, religion, whatever it is that they're taking on. And of course, the military. And, and it's not extracurricular. It's, it's critical. Right. I think that this point of groups are so critical for men. And if they don't have them, they'll find, you know, very antisocial groups. They'll find gangs and, uh, you know, terrorist organizations and whatnot. But if we don't have these healthy groups and organizations for men, then they'll, they'll find, you know, other, uh, other substitutes. Now, going back to female friendships, you know, you called it extracurricular. And I think this is such a harsh truth, but, but I guess, you know, it is what it is. The fact that our friendships are a bonus, but they're not a priority, right? When a, a girl, you know, a teenage girl gets a boyfriend, she'll abandon her girlfriends. And, and, and that's just a pattern that you see over and over again. And as you said, organizing a family, right? A woman organizes her family and that's definitely a priority. So I don't know what we can do about that, but I think just understanding it and understanding that, you know, we do have uh, these ways of relating to one another uh, that can be quite tricky to navigate, right? So I do want to get into a little bit of that more antisocial female behavior, right? Which is more about social exclusion, as you said, and gossiping and, uh, you know, social reputation destruction at its uh, at its worst. So this whole mean girl phenomenon, and 
I was honestly quite surprised when I, you know, Googled Mean Girls or when I, I searched in Google Scholar for Mean Girls to, you know, see a little bit of uh, what's been written. A lot of articles came up and said, you know, this is a stereotype. This is just uh, the movies have been mm. uh, have pushing this idea. And uh, I have to say, you know, being a, a tomboy uh, growing up and moving around a lot. And, you, you know, you mentioned this, that, you know, being the new girl isn't exactly isn't exactly a good thing. But, you know, I didn't really know the girl code. I didn't know. I didn't really speak the language. I didn't know that it wasn't appropriate to say my opinion, you know, and compete and just be happy about a good grade. I thought, oh, she's my friend. She's going to be happy for me as I <laughs> would be for her. <laughs> no chance, right? So I think you can really uh, see, you know, this a mean girl phenomenon, you know, throughout. And I would love to hear from you, you know, what you've found in the different experiments that you that you've done, where girls really did engage in the social exclusion and this gossiping kind of behavior. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't like the term mean girls because I don't think girls are any meaner than boys are. And I know that's what everybody out there in the culture, you know, likes to say. I mean, boys are really mean. And of course, men do much more mean things like burning children and, and you know, doing horrible things around the world. You know, they, they're as mean as you can get. So um, nonetheless, uh, certainly girls need to take care of themselves and girls are agentic and same for women, right? So what do you do? I mean, certainly in non-humans, females need to get the resources. They need their good real estate so their offspring can survive. They need things. And how do you do that when some other female wants it? So there's you have to figure out strategies. And if that's called mean, I think that's a little bit unfair. But yes, girls are competitive and, and women are competitive and so are non-human females for good reason. They're trying to pass on their genes through taking care of their offspring. So what does it mean to be competitive if you are a female, which is different than direct competition, direct what I call interference competition. If you're a male, it's like just grab what you want, right? Or push somebody over and that's it. Females don't do that. So what do you do? What is the female code, which is, which is very, very interesting. And so certainly what I've seen in my experiments, for example, when I had one experiment with four-year-olds and we provided either one puppet for three children or two or three. When there's three puppets, everybody can play. When there are two puppets, there's a little bit of sharing. One puppet is a problem. And what would the boys do? They would just go running around and around and around in a circle. And the guy with the puppet, this four-year-old, he would hold on to it and just let the others chase him. And the others would try to pull and grab and Girls don't do that. What would they do? Uh, it was amazing to watch at four. The girls would go and hide behind the piano. So the one girl who got this great, big, huge, wonderful puppet, she was left all by herself. She would abandon the puppet and try to go over and be able to talk to the other girls. I saw in one case, two girls, they put a box over their head so they couldn't see the girl with the puppet. So oh, wow. what you're talking about is a very effective and it feels horrible so i understand where the word mean comes from but it's different the other boys are screaming and shouting and chasing and hitting this boy who has the puppet that's that's also mean but here it feels so awful and you can see the girl with the puppet she just gives it up she doesn't even want it and then nobody takes the puppet and they don't even look at her anymore so oh, that's just something that i you know i have done in experiments with four-year-olds but with 10 year olds, that was, that was a study done in Boston with 10 year olds. I did a study in, um, in England and I just said, put on a play and whoever puts on the best play, every child will get $20 each, which is, or 20 pounds each, which is a lot of money for a 10 year old. And, you know, there the boys were much more cohesive in their groups and the girls managed to put on plays where they would exclude another girl to the point of, even though they got a prize for the best play, they actually sent some girls into tears, obviously not earning them the winning prize. And it was so painful to watch. They would literally go around her and yell, loser, 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 and they would use social exclusion. In fact, in almost every single play, that is the theme of the play, how to exclude a girl. So obviously for that girl who gets excluded, it's horribly mean. It feels terrible. And um, 
that is a theme of what girls do. Now, it's not always social exclusion. There's also things that, you know, girls and women do that are very underhanded, but competitive. So, you know, it's something like, oh, isn't it hard to find a really nice dress? And you look at somebody else's dress, right? Now, that sounds like compassionate, right? So a boy would think, or a man would think, oh, that was nice. But any girl or woman knows you're insulting my dress, right? But done in a way that's so confusing. And, you know, I think Tanya Reynolds talks about this, this compassionate com competition, right? Where you're saying, oh, wow, can you believe that happened to you? I'm so sorry. And that sounds nice, but it's really a way of competing and saying, look, she is a loser here, right? She has, you know, this big problem. And I think Oftentimes what's going on is girls and women are not upfront with one another about their agentic activities. So if what you, you talked about getting an A or whether it's some kind of skating championship or whatever it is, academics, athletics, whatever, girls are not saying what they're doing. They're not bragging, hey, I won or I got this great grade because that is not acceptable. It has to be equal. And so what you get is girls are quietly under the table competing to do the best they can for themselves and to be independent. But you can't say that and you can't let anybody know because they'll go after you. So you have this very complex, as I talked about before, you know, balance between being, you know, nice and equal and trying to do well for yourself. And that's not great when your self-worth is pitted against your friendship. And so it is a, a tough balance and it takes, I think, maybe a, a, a friendship from early childhood that's lasted for decades to be able to overcome that because that's sort of almost like kinship. It's irreplaceable. Right. And then you can maybe say, oh, yeah, you've done so well and I haven't. But, hey, we're going to be there for each other until we die. And, and then, you know, but girls' friendships are competitive boys friendships are competitive and that's true into adulthood as well and it certainly makes sense i mean what woman is going to say well you know i don't want to go with this guy who makes so much money um who would which would really benefit me and my children and maybe more likely to survive and thrive because you have kind of this guy who doesn't make so much money so i'll just i'll i'll, I'll skip him you know and that's a fact i mean that's life it I do think girls and women's lives are more serious. They have to take better care of themselves. They're constantly going to be responsible for their gene survival. They're on the front lines of that for their whole lives. And boys and men, you know, they have, I think, an easier time in terms of worry. They have to, you know, they have to meet eventually if they're going to pass on their genes. And in a lot of cultures, fathers can be very helpful. But, you know, overall, fathers are not clear how much they help their their genes you know especially if there's family members around who will help uh, absolutely absolutely i think you know this uh this understanding that women are a lot more susceptible to first of all worry of course but we feel the social exclusion a lot more than a guy would right we're a lot more sensitive to offenses you also did this uh study where uh, women interpreted, you know, people's behavior as more offensive and the guys didn't really feel it, right? They do have a, a bit more of a carefree attitude and which enables them to bounce back and reconcile uh, a, a lot easier. So I completely agree. And I think, I think that's where, you know, this mean girls idea comes from because women are a lot more sensitive and boys can just hit each other and be mean and call each other names and ah, they shrug it off. You know, it's, uh, it doesn't leave a mark, uh, as much, uh, definitely. Um, yeah. Joyce, where can people find you? What are you working on, uh, you know, in the next couple of months and what can, what can they be expecting from you? Um, so, you know, my, my projects now are really looking at, um, hierarchies and how women cope with hierarchies because, Mostly men have created the organizations that we have in Western society. Um, and so women are trying to join those. And that's tough because they're very hierarchical. So my question is, how do women 
cope with hierarchies? How, how do they deal with women who are higher and lower status than they are? And that's something to me that's a really important question. I'm also very interested because non-human primate females, unless they live with their kin, also want everybody to be all equal. They also want are more individualistic and don't um, compete overtly. So there's something I think very, very basic about it. So I'm trying to understand, is it true that just by being higher ranked or lower ranked, females won't like you? And can we change organizations in some way so that maybe the hierarchies are less emphasized? Maybe there are fewer tiers. Maybe it's like everybody works together as a one class and then everyone moves up together. So it makes it a little bit easier for, for women to be successful in, in organizations um, as opposed to men who love the, you know, it's not to say that men don't want to be high status, but they more enjoy the, the fluidity, the competition, the getting there and more accepting of that. So I think that that might have real implications for, for the workforce, for, for women who are not that used to being with non-kin. All, all day long. I think that's really a very recent innovation for women. And it's hard to figure out how do you deal with non-kin, and especially when you have kin at home who usually need you. And so it, it really is a tough, tough balance um, for, for women, I think. That's fascinating. I'm looking forward to reading it. I think this is such important work and uh, can definitely help us, you know, achieve the goals that we want as a society. So thank you, Joyce. This has been wonderful. Uh, you're welcome. Okay.